Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said and this has been reported in a musnad of Imam Ahmed on the authority of Abu Huraira sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said whoever lives in the desert he becomes coarse becomes rough and hardened and whoever comes close to the rulers becomes further away from Allah azawajal now this narration is in fact very famous and has similar wording in fact when narrated by Abdullah ibn Abbas where sallallahu alaihi wasallam again said the same thing he said that the one who lives in the desert becomes rough and whoever comes close to the ruler falls into fitan, falls into fitna. So you can appreciate and understand in fact, if Rasulullah was warning against the one who comes close to the Muslim ruler, for greater qiyas, by greater analogy, we can appreciate and understand what about then the one who comes close to the ruler who is not a Muslim. And I'm not talking about murtad, but the one who is kafir asli. The one who is kafir asli, meaning the one who rules by man-made law or rules by what is known today as democratic system, democratic way of life. What then is to be said about the one who comes close to Western governments and becomes like an agent for him on his own behalf to introduce this reformation of Islam, this new version of British Islam or American Islam or Western Islam and starts to propagate to the masses and starts to dress up the batil as the haq meaning a form of zandaka that somebody is committing. If we look to the statement of Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, where he gave this nasiha, this advice to Sa'id bin Yaqub, he said, worldly pleasures, are, they, they are a disease. And everybody, they can appreciate that. The matters of the dunya, they are a disease. And he said, power is a disease. But the scholar himself, the alim himself, he's like a doctor. Meaning here we can appreciate and understand the dunya itself is a fitan. To refrain from the dunya is something noteworthy and something for us to be acknowledged. And the doctor himself is the alim. The alim is the one who will be able to provide a solution. The alim is the one who we can refer to. Al ulema wa rathatul anbiya. The ulema, they are the inheritors of the anbiya. So we should refer to the ulema. We should refer to the, we should refer to the scholars. Ahl sunnah, ahl haq, ahl tawheed. In order to understand the truth. But he said, if that doctor, if, he, if this physician, if you will, if he brings upon himself some form of disease, then you need to be aware of him. Meaning for greater reason now, if the person who's trying, you're trying to go to for the cure, for the solution, is himself subject to this fitan, as we understand, by going to the gates of the doors of the ruler, then what about then? For us, how is it possibly that he can help us? And more than that, Rasulullah he said, the thing that I fear for my ummah the most, more than the appearance of the Dajjal, which is a great fitna and a great test, it is the ulama asu, the misguided scholars. Those people who regurgitate the Quran and recite the verses of the Quran, those people who are hafid of Quran. And it did not Rasulullah in fact say that most of the munafiqeen are those people who are the qadis, those people who are the reciters of the Quran, those people who have the great tajweed, and in fact, been description being given of the Khawarij, in fact, of having the uh, good Tajweed and ha knowing all of the Arabic and knowing all of the, uh, all of being Ahluga and knowing all of the Quran. But it does not go even past their own throats. It does not even go past their own throats. And they would leave the, 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 the Deen the way the arrow, it leaves the own bow. How? Because of their extremity. And this form of extremism that we find today is manifested in this form of what we can call secular fundamentalism. Secular fundamentalism is like an extreme way of understanding this deviation and this separation between, between, um, uh, between uh, society and between our own governance and between God's laws, between Allah's governance on earth. This separation between the two is what's being pushed today and what's being cultivated today. And anyone who then wants to further the cause of Allah's governance on earth, then he's going to be regarded as an extremist. Even Tony Blair, he came out and he said, those people who believe in the concept of Khilafah, Al-Khilafah, or the Sharia, or the Hakamiyah of Allah Azawajal, then they are what? They are extremist. They are the violent extremists. And now this definition being given, in fact, by even some British MPs within the parliament in their own discussion, giving definition of what, an, what is an extremist. And they said there are two types of extremists. There is the violent extremist and then there is the non-violent extremist. What's the difference between the two? They say one is violent and one is non-violent, but, but they are both extremists. One believes in the concept of Khilafah and he's willing to fight for it. The other one, he believes in the concept of Khilafah, but he's not willing to fight for it. Meaning they are both still extremists. 
Reminds us of the verse inside the Quran where we contextualize and look at everything and step back and look at the whole broader picture of what's exactly going on today. It is The Jews and the Christians don't ever be pleased with you until you leave your own deen, until you leave your own way of life. Allah Allah said the disbelievers they wish to wipe out the nur of Islam. They wish to wipe this out. But Allah he would never allow this to happen. So the apparent problems that we can witness, they are in fact a great fitna, fitna and a great try for us. Much more greater than the problems from the outside. The problems from the outside, they're easy for us to handle. They're easy for us to swallow. Why? Because they're the apparent clear problems from the outside of the house of Islam, outside of Darul Islam. You can see how the enemies, how they plot, how the enemies of, uh, of Allah, His Rasul and the Ummah, how they've been apparently been described within the Quran about their wishes or what they want for you. How they wish for you to lead the deen, how they wish to harm you, how they wish for you to have this gafla of your arms and your own baggage. Allah described this in the Quran that uh, they, they wish that you have this negligence, negligence, excuse me, of your own arms and your own baggage so they, they can attack you in one single rush. Meaning, so, so once you start to become weak, reminds us of the hadith again, very famously, how Rasulullah said, nations would gather around you like one being invited to a meal. And all of them would argue amongst themselves, they would dispute amongst themselves, I'll take this part, you take that part. Is that not what happened more than a hundred years ago? With the destruction of the Uthmani Khilafah, the Western nations, the League of Nations, the Christian nations coming together from Europe and Eastern Europe and deciding who's going to take what. One part is going to take Algeria, one part is going to take North Africa, one part is going to take Al-Hind, one part is going to take Philistine and give it away to the Jews, to, uh, to the so-called Israelis. All of this you can find happening. That is the apparent problem. That apparent problem is very easy for us to identify. Why? Because it's something clear and something which Allah has told us within the Quran. But those problems from within, even though they are from within, they are so uh, easy for us to identify if we open up the book of Allah and the, and the sunnah of the Messenger Muhammad وسلم, and his own example. And even in fact, look to the seerah of Rasulullah وسلم, how the Sahaba, how they used to deal with and how the Prophet used to uh, deal with and admonish those people who are the munafikeen, those people who used to proclaim their Islam but used to conceal their own nifaq. Those are the ones who are the problems from within. So the power problem is easy for us to identify, but the problem from within is when, for example, someone he takes like a chisel or a hammer or a screwdriver or some type of tool or whatever, and he's chipping away at the glass of the house or the door of the house. Eventually, that's going to affect all of us. If it's the door or the window, eventually it will shatter. It will allow the enemy to enter directly. Not only that, the cracks within there, that shrapnel of the glass, it will affect us when it, you know, maybe comes back, it comes back and hits us in our own face. And it will harm everybody, whether it be young, whether it be rich, whether it be, whether it be poor, whether it be strong, whether it be weak. And those people who are weak will be affected by this. Why? Because this glass on the apparent, or this cloak on the apparent, was on the, on the, on the outside of it. And its appearance looked like it was the cloak of Islam. Some alim, some scholars, some, sh some sheikh, some from amongst the shayu. But in fact, they were the ulema al su, the misguided evil scholars. They were the ones who were chipping away from within. On behalf of who? On behalf of their pay masters. As the Arab saying it goes, the one who pays is the one who controls. So this is the fitna that we can find. In light of this, if we look to the present day, what is known as the war on terror or the war against Islam, and there's no ambiguity about that. It's quite transparent and quite clear what that is all about. That is the war against Islam and the Muslims. That has to be fulfilled by the, by the West via certain policies that they will put forth. Those policies themselves cannot be fulfilled unless there's certain measures that they can, be, they, they can undertake. There's certain uh, pointers or certain uh, uh, matters which need to be uh, taken into hand and exercised and executed in order for those policies to be exercised. And there's many of them, but at the top of them, we can say the media propaganda tool. And this is very, very important and very significant for our own reality because this is what really affects us as a Muslim Ummah today, heavily today. The media propaganda tool is used as a whip to try and create this frenzy amongst the community and then subdue us via the power of fear. And the power of fear is when someone then becomes submissive to the desires and the wishes of the master, of the so-called master, of the oppressor, of the dalim. The power of fear is done via what? Media propaganda of creating this Islamophobia 
uh, creating this anxiety amongst the people, saying that there's some so-called threat. And then obviously then now the government then need to introduce policies and draft measures and security, uh, 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 you know, security measures, emergency powers as a consequence of that. And the reality of that is what? Muslims being arrested, Muslims being targeted, Muslims being uh, targeted at airports, at seaports, Muslims having their passports removed from them, revoked from them, uh, Muslims having their own children taken away from them. All of this is taking place. All of this is taking place under the blanket uh, blanket disguise of war on terror or war against radicalization, war against extremism, violent extremism. Without any of those people who claim to be putting forth those policies and drafting up these measures and putting forth these labels without even themselves to be able to define what those terms they mean. I mean, who defines what is a terrorist? Who defines what is, a, what is an extremist? How can it be only one side is able to define those terms and another side he's not allowed to define those terms? So where is the uh, political discourse happening? Where is the engagement between the communities? There is none really happening. There is none really happening. It is just one-sided oppression taking place. One-sided, a lopsided law, which is, as Allah has described, if the kuffar, if they have authority over you, they'll leave no sanctity. So this is what's taking place. This power of fear is then used to control the Muslim Ummah. How? Because when these raids and these sort of things happen, then that's when the Ummah starts to become subdued. That's when the, the Ummah itself it starts to have this fear factor. This fear factor of being fearful of speaking out. Being fear, having this fear of not standing up for the Haqq. And, not, and when Jafar, when he, he said, he described Radio Ta'ala, he said, when we gave the bayah to Rasulullah we pledged that we would speak the truth wherever we are. So speaking the truth, commanding good and forbidding evil, Amr bil maruf wa nahyin al munkar, it is something which is an attribute of this ummah. But how can that possibly be the attribute of the ummah if in fact we have fear, al hawf, not of Allah, but of mankind? So you can see how detrimental the power of fear it is. Then that then leads us on to the colonization. This is exactly what then what takes place, the colonization of our hearts and our minds. The battle of hearts and minds nowadays is one of colonizing the heart and the mind of the Muslim to make sure that it always looks up to the West. It doesn't look at anything through the Islamic shades, it looks at everything through the non-Islamic shades, through what the West it wants, what the British government they want, what the Western governments what they want. That colonization is done via this proxy of agents imposed upon us. Not just talking about the rulers, but in regards to the scholars who become the security apparatus for those rulers. I'm talking about just in the East. What then can be said within the West is then to try and create this stability between the two fronts, between the military fronts in which the West they're fighting and between the ideological fronts. And the two can never ever be separated. The two, they must be understood that that's exactly what is going on today. There is two fronts being fought. There's the military side, the physical onslaught against, against the Muslim lands, as well as the ideological onslaught. And that is, my dear brothers, this controlling of the hearts and the minds. How? By having this authority over us. This using this authority over us, meaning the ulama, to try and suppress our own anger and frustration. And anger for the sake of Allah. As Rasulullah he said, don't get angry, don't get angry, don't get angry, except for the sake of Allah. So anger can be used for the sake of Allah, and anger can be used... Uh, in a negative way as well. But anger for the sake of a lie is something which is good, so long as there's no any injustice uh, committed. So even we have this bara from the kuffar, still it does not mean that we're allowed to oppress anybody. So this authority of control is a global strategy then, my dear brothers, to control Islam and Muslims. And this is done via the munafiqeen. Done via the munafiqeen. Those policies are then fulfilled like I said, by those various pointers, and there's much more that we could possibly mention, but by funding and promoting and cloaking what we can call and describe really as the Home Office Imam today. The Home Office Imam today will be the one who will come out and say exactly what the ruler he wants to say. I'm not talking about the Kafir ruler now, the, the apostate ruler. We're talking about the Kafir Asli ruler, meaning the policies of the West, what they want, those policies they are being enacted. How? By this funding, by this cloaking of giving titles to them and promoting them as the representatives of the Muslim, uh, uh, Muslim uh, uh, community. But this goes hand in hand with a number of matters which we need to be aware of. That is the funding, but then on the other side is the greed from those munafikeen as well. 
So the desire to try and corrupt Islam and the desire for greed from both sides, from the Munafiqeen and the Kuffar, they become awliya of one another. And that becomes the biggest enemy from within. And in the time of crisis, when we should be referring to those ulama, instead for them to become a source of construction for us, meaning the ones who we can seek advice, well, Alim, Ya Sheikh, what is it that we're supposed to do? Imam Sahib, what are we supposed to do? Ya Mulana, Ya Mullah, well, Imam, whatever title you have, what is it that we're supposed to do? How are we supposed to feel? And we should know this. We should be able to refer back to the scholars in order to advise us and tell us, in fact, they become a source of destruction. The common response then, in order to try and deflate our own anger and deflate our own emotions and to in fact kill off any morale and break our own moral backbone is responses such as what can we do Gufar are so powerful you know they have authority over us uh, you know uh, better to better to remain silent safety first you know some some uh, uh, you know ajib garib manhaj or even further some people they start to say in fact we deserve this uh, this is a punishment from Allah because we never woke up for Fajr or never we had a, a you know a miswalk inside our own mouth or we left off the Sunnah. Yes, it's true. In fact, we did leave off the Sunnah. But what about the Sunnah of what's in in in, in relation to the actual fitna that we face? So if, for example, there's something which is taking place, there must be the correct solution for that. You can't give me the solution, which is for another reality. Understanding the fickle waqi, the reality, understanding fickle dalil, and understanding the fickle hukum, they all go hand in hand in order for us to proceed, in order for, uh, for us to pro progress and move forward. Otherwise, we're taking 10 steps backwards. We're like a crab moving side to side. We're not going to get anywhere. We're just going to get harmed time and time again. When this fear is being pushed, my dear brothers, and when we find that there's this kind of fitna, we need some type of guidance. And the best guidance is the book of Allah. And the best example for us is the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But what kind of guidance can we have in the time of crisis? How is it that we're supposed to react? How is it that we are supposed to behave? What is it that we can possibly teach to the Muslim Ummah? What kind of tools that we need in the time of crisis? How can we cripple the plots of the Tawagheed? The plots of the Tawakid, they are there to try and destroy Islam and the Muslims. They're there to try and suppress any Islamic awakening. It's an ideological war. So for us, there needs to be an uh, uh, ideological defense, meaning strengthening of the Muslim community, strengthening of the Muslim Ummah. How can we do so? Let's look to a couple of points that we can in fact act upon. Number one is at tawakkul at tawakkul is this instilling trust of, trust of Allah, Zawajal, the trust into Allah, Zawajal, into the heart of the Ummah. We need to direct our own uh, fear and guidance via our own da'wah by teaching the Muslim Ummah this. What is a taqwa? A taqwa, or excuse me, a tawakkul. What is a tawakkul? Tawakkul is the total reliance upon Allah, Zawajal, believing that the action that you do, meaning having this trust in Allah, Zawajal, will have an uh, outcome. You believe that Allah Azawajal, He is Al Wakil, and you, your own self, is Al Mutawakil, the one who places His own trust in Allah Azawajal. You rely on Him for the outcome. Now, for this Tawakkal, there's three conditions which we need to be aware of. The first condition being uh, is Al Imanu Ibtida, that you rely on Allah Azawajal and you don't rely on anyone else. Now, if we teach the Muslim Ummah this, that we rely on Allah and not anybody else, because to rely on somebody else, it would be shirk, shirk billah. This kills off any idea that we need to go to United Nations or that we need to go to an MP or we need to go to somebody who's a non-Muslim who, who doesn't even know how to wash his own backside and commits shirk, associates partners with Allah How are we going to possibly refer to him? So this kills off any idea of that. The Prophet wasallam he said, tie the camel and trust in Allah Azawajal. He said, do the action, meaning do the action, tie the not in the in the rope of the camel uh, camel and then trust in Allah Azawajal. Some people what they say is tie the camel and then rely on man. Again, dodgy aqidah, this deviant idea of this tawakkal. There's no tawakkal in fact there. And some people they say don't tie the camel at all. Just trust in Allah. So have trust in Allah that he will alleviate our own situation but don't do anything about it. So you do what? You do as the Prophet said. He said tie the camel, you do the action and then you trust in Allah and you believe in him for the outcome. Then wal amalu wasatan. When you're doing the action, when you're doing the da'wah, or you're commanding the, for, commanding the good and forbidding the evil, when you're engaging, for example, in the battle of hearts and minds, is you believe that Allah Azawajal, He is wakil. During that action, you believe Allah Azawajal, He will help, He will respond. And then thirdly is, وَالتَّفْوِيدُ niyatan. You totally rely on Allah Azawajal for the end result. You know, all the way to the end, Allah he will, will respond. He will, he will uh, answer your prayer. He will answer your call. He will uh, fulfill your action. He will accept your own action. And He will, in fact, help you in all calamity. 
And in fact, if we look to the Anbiya, in fact, you can see how they had this particular tawakkul. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was the one who stood up against the idols. And as a consequence of that, he was put within the fire. And when he put, was put in the fire, meaning the man-made fire, the fire which they, the furnace that which they made to try and throw him from a catapult in, reminds us in fact of the Muslims today, how they're being thrown from one catapult in one land, such as Afghanistan or Iraq, and being flown and shipped inside their own uh, aeroplanes all the way to Guantanamo Bay, which is sort of like a furnace in fact, being you know put under the middle of the sun and then uh, being tortured and, and ridiculed and mocked. He said, Hasbunallah wa na'mal wakil. Hasbunallah wa na'mal wakil. Sufficient for us is Allah Azawajal. And we depend upon Allah Azawajal. That is, should be our own motto, really, in fact, in our own da'wah. Whenever we face this fitna and uh, struggle, Hasbunallah wa na'mal wakil. Sufficient for us is Allah Azawajal. We don't depend on any man. We don't depend on any king. And we don't fear any man. And we don't fear any king. And we don't fear the helpers of the agents of the Tawaheed. All of the crusaders and all of their own alliance, the ones who hate Islam and the ones who want to try and destroy Islam, we don't fear them whatsoever. Jibreel alayhi salam, he came to Ibrahim alayhi salam and he said, Ya, ya Ibrahim, O oh Ibrahim, shall I make the fire cool for you? Shall I help you? He said, in, he said uh, 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 sufficient for me is Allah's wajal. He didn't turn around and say, I, I, you know, I need help from you. In fact, he refused the help. Nowadays, what people are doing, if you know, if you ask, if you say to them, for example, Hillary Clinton, she's going to help you. Barack Obama, he's going to help you. Yeah. They turn around and say, OK, 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 yeah, 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 no problem. Let me make one more phone call to her. And some people even go further nowadays. They start to write letter, in fact, for the release of our own sister, Afia Sadiqi. They said we need to write letter to who? To uh, Hillary Clinton. And she's going to help us. Hillary Clinton, who was the wife of Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, the one President Pinocchio, we call him. Uh, Bill Clinton, the one who uh, bombed Muslims inside Iraq, the one who sent his own army uh, into Somalia, in fact. Black Hawk down, all of this you know, torturing of Muslims over there. How possibly someone can go to Hillary Clinton or rely on United Nations like people they do today when they go to the UN, UN, 1441, and they're going to help us inside Palestine. Palestine, they're going to help you? These are the ones who gave away Palestine to the Israelis, to the Jews. You don't know that? How possibly people, they start to become so deceived and deluded. Musa Ali Salam, Musa Ali Salam, he had the Shabab with him. Uh, he had the youth with him and the, the, some disabled and weak. And when he reached the sea, I remember he was chasing, chased by the Fir'aun of his own time, uh, meaning like this uh, Obama of our own time. And the people, they start to say, Ya Musa, behind us is what? The army of Fir'aun. The army of Fir'aun. What did Musa Ali Salam he respond? He responded by saying exactly the same thing as Ibrahim Ali Salam. He said, Hasbun Allah wa Na'mal Wakil. Sufficient for us is Allah. We rely on Allah, we depend on Allah, and Allah's Wajal, he opened up the sea. More than that, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, during his own time, there was an old man and a woman. Now, they had a son who used to help them. They used to, you know, rely, really rely on their own son. But he was kidnapped. If you can imagine now this type of calamity, it's um, one thing for someone to lose their own son or their own daughter, but another thing when you are totally reliant upon them, not in the reliance like the way you rely on Allah, but day to day you rely on them, for example, to get your shopping for you, your food, uh, you know, they clean the house or whatever it is, they help you in, in some way or another. And Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to the man, say, La hawla wa la quta illa billah. There is no might or power except that of Allah's wajal. What did the man respond? The man never turned around and said, what do you mean? La hawla wa la quta illa billah. Yeah, we understand that. Now what do we do now? Nothing. Rasulullah said, just say la hawla wa la quta illa billah. The man, he went home and he informed his wife. His wife said, what did Rasulullah say? You told him that what, what, what difficult we got. Imagine somebody goes to the Khalif now and he says, look, my son's being kidnapped. What are you going to do about it? He said, just say la hawla wa la quta illa billah. The man said, what kind of Khalif are you? He'll be totally against him. He'll be totally opposing him. Ah, my, my, my son is lost and now you're going to tell me la hawla wa la quta illa billah. What kind of sheikh are you? What kind of Khalif are you? So... The woman, she never complained. The man and the woman, the husband and the wife, they both said, both said, La hawla wa la quta illa billah. In fact, what happened was the son himself, the people who had kidnapped him, the son, he managed to release himself. And when he released himself, he didn't just release himself. In fact, he managed to go and find the captor's money. Whatever ganima or so-called booty that these captors, these, you know, these uh, kidnappers, uh, they've been taking maybe from other people as well. He managed to take all of that money and came back home. And when he came back home to his mother and his father, the old man and the, the, the old woman, they said, we never seen so much wealth. 
We never seen we never seen so much money before in our own life. Allah's word he revealed a verse: "We will provide from you from sources you could never imagine." If someone reads this verse today, they'll, they'll think, "Oh, we could pro Allah provides us sources from we, 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 where we could possibly never ever imagine. Maybe it's the kafir is going to provide us. Maybe he's going to come and deliver us some money, some food, or whatever." But could they possibly imagine that this was revealed in regards to the circumstance of revelation? The asbab and nuzul of this was regarding one boy who was kidnapped. He freed his own self. Nobody else freed him. He freed himself with the permission of Allah Azawajal. And then he managed to get the money from his own captors and from his own kidnappers and bring that money back to his own mother and his father. If you not go to somebody's house today and he's got big money and he's got big house and big Lamborghini and everything and you ask him, how, how did you earn this? How did you get all of this money? Me, I was working as an MP. A'udhu Billah. Or the other one, he says, I was working in the bank dealing with riba. A'udhu Billah. Allah. What kind of money is this? Another one, he says, I worked very, very hard for this. I was working, you know, maybe I was... Um, you know, trading in food or something like that, trading in something, you know, so, uh, so, so, some type of halal business. You say, mashallah. But if you go to somebody's house and, he's, and you say to him, where you get all of this money from? And he said, well, what it was, my son, he got kidnapped and he managed to free himself and managed to take all of the money from the captor, meaning Barack Obama. He managed to take all of Obama's wealth and he managed to come home with it. You say, subhanallah, what, what kind of wahid are you? What kind of Muslim are you? You never heard any story like this. Sadly, we don't hear these kind of stories today. Suleiman Salam, he was someone who was given power, in fact, to speak to the animals and the jinns. And he once asked the ant, how much is it that you eat every year? One ant. He said, two grains of rice. He put him in a jar and he, uh, uh, he put two grains of rice. And he came back a little while later and he found only one grain had been eaten, another grain it was still there. And he said, why did you lie to me? <laughs> you asked me how much you eat. I asked you how much you eat, excuse me, and you told me two grains of rice. I come back and I find this one grain of rice still sitting there. Well, what well, kind of, what, maybe you're an FBI agent. Maybe you're a Fed. Maybe you're working for MI5, SO15, CIA, whatever it is, yeah? Maybe you're working for the Gestapo or something. Why, why you lie to me? And he said, before I used to rely on Allah's vision, but now I rely on you. And you are a man, you may forget. So I saved the other grain, meaning like save for a rainy day. What a lesson in, in fact, just from the ant, we can appreciate how to have this tawakkul, how to have this trust in and reliance upon Allah's wajal. Another part of this tawakkul, well, another condition of this uh, tawakkul is husnu dhan billah. Don't doubt Allah's wajal. Don't start to doubt him. You want to boost the morale of the Muslims uh, at the time of fitna via this iman and via this uh, tawakkul. So this shak which people they may have, how is it possibly we can be victorious? You want to try and, and, and kill off. A good example of that is the Battle of Badr and many verses in fact revealed around, uh, about this. But the Battle of Badr, Badr was what? Battle of Badr was when there was maybe 300 and 313 Sahaba facing more than you know a thousand of the enemy and they never had any weapons amongst them. They only had like one camel or one horse, the Sahaba. Uh, which I believe it belonged to al Mikdal, And in the end, no one really used it anyway because they felt so shy from one another over who's going to use it. I mean, if you can imagine, for example, one bottle of water, and I have one bottle of water here, but one bottle of water uh, amongst 300 people, everyone's going to feel shy over who's going to use it. Everyone's going to feel shy over using this, uh, this particular camel. Yet they were victorious. So Allah Azawajal, he said, in fact, to the nearest meaning, that the minority will always defeat the majority. So the haq and the victory, and the victory which will be established, is not going to be by the hands of the majority, rather it's going to be by the hands of the minority, with the mi mi minority upon the truth. And Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, there will always be a portion, the portion of this dahirin, of this taifa al-mansura, of this, uh, you know, victorious group, who will always be, you know, uh, victorious until the end and they will always be harsh towards the enemy they will always teach the, the enemy a lesson in fact uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam praised them this minority group and there's good lesson for us in this in chapter uh, in chapter Ali Imran verse 139 Allah wa he said so do not become weak against your enemy don't feel down don't feel sad indeed you will be victorious if you are indeed true believers. Don't feel down, don't feel depressed. There's nothing for you to get depressed about. Well, what is it possible we can, we can do for us? So long as we rely on Allah, so long as we depend on Allah, Allah He will assist. He will send down His Malaika, just like the way He sent down in Battle of Badr, and how we assisted the believers. 
And how many believers that you'll find victorious in fact today? Maybe you've been accused of a crime. Maybe you find some difficulty in your own personal life. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviates that situation. He turns that bad situation into something good. And it may be something which you think is bad for you, but in fact it's good for you. And there's something which you may think is good for you, but in fact it's bad for you. Allah, he knows and you know not. You know not. So this is in fact lesson for us always to go back to the Quran. Always to go back to the Kitab and the Sunnah and look to how we should trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we look to the ayat inside the Quran, which talk about At-Tawakkul, and we see the example of the Sahaba, you will find how many ayat they were revealed in regards to having this trust, having this reliance on Allah In chapter Ali Imran verse 139, Allah he said, Wala in mu'minin. Do not become weak against your enemy. Don't feel down. Don't feel depressed. Don't be sad. Indeed, you will be victorious if you are the believers. If you are somebody who has Iman and you have this trust and reliance upon, uh, upon Allah then Allah he will help you. He will make you victorious. So there's nothing ever for us to feel down about. More than that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, in yansur, in yansurkum Allah, if Allah, he helps you, no one, he can overcome you. And if he forsake, forsakes you, فَمَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يُنْسُرْكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ وَعَلَىٰ عَلَيْهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلْ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, and if he forsakes you, who is there after him that can help you? And in Allah, let the believers, let them put their own trust. In, Ali, in chapter Ali Imran, verse 160. So there's nothing I ask for us to ever for, for us to ever feel down and depressed about. More than that, Allah SWT said, Alladina kala lahum an nasu an nas ka jamahu lakum fakshokum fazadahum iman and wakalu husband Allah wa na'mal wakil. Allah SWT, he described about the munafikeen. He said, Those believers unto whom the munafikeen, when they start to have this uh, whispering and they you know they try to make this own tasweef, in fact, they said, Verily the people they gathered against you. So fear them. Allah Azawajal, he said, but he only increased them in faith. And they said, sufficient for us is Allah, and he is the best disposer of our own affairs. Hasbun Allah wa na'mal wakil. So here we can appreciate in this ayah a lesson, in fact, how the munafikeen will always have this kind of speech. The munafikeen will always say, fear them. Look at you, you got nothing. Look to them, they're so big, they're so bad, they've got everything. But in fact, what a lesson in fact inside this verse, how Allah Azawajal, he described how the, the believers, they were only increased in faith. And you can see, in fact, for the one who is the Muahid, when some calamity befalls him, when some hardship like this comes towards him, maybe his home is raided, maybe he's persecuted because of his own da'wah, you will find his own iman will be increased. With the munafiq, he will run a mile before any test even come, like people they say today, us today, because of you, these laws are going to come in. What because of us? What are you talking about? And how does this law affect you anyway? You've never been targeted by the kuffar. And they ask themselves, in fact, they say, why are the kuffar trying to label us now? Why are the kuffar they trying to ban us? We're such good law-abiding Muslims and we, and we always uphold the British values and promote their own values by promoting voting and working with the police and working with the authorities and defending this home office Islam. You see now, so the munafikin will be exposed by the hands of the kuffar and the munafikin, they expose themselves by their own tongue as well. How at the time of fitna, they try to dissuade you and try to persuade you to become what? Become weak become defeated and deple depleted of your own morale, of your own wala and your own bara and your own hatred towards the Tawaheed. And in fact, this bara from the Tawaheed is a part and parcel of our own Iman. Loving and hating for the sake of Allah is from the branches of Iman. But Munafikin, they hate this. In another verse, the next verse, in fact, 174 of Ali Imran. So they returned with grace and bounty from Allah. No harm, it touched them. And they followed the good pleasure of Allah. And Allah is the owner of great bounty. So after this difficulty, after this difficulty, when the believers, when they placed their trust in Allah, they came back with great gains, great booty, great ganima. They were victorious. They had their held, held, held up high. Munafikin then, they, you know, the kind of reaction they will always give to this. Allah SWT then he said, and it is only shaitan that suggests to you the fear of his own awliya. Uh, Allah SWT, he said, uh, So don't fear them, but fear me. If you are true believers, never start to say it's uh, we're useless, it's our own fault. No, if you fear Allah's wajal and you rely on Allah's wajal, then that is a sign of your own belief. It's a sign of your own iman. So we need to prove to Allah's wajal that we're true believers. It's not a matter of just making statements from our own tongue, but rather that must be manifested via our own action and proving to Allah's wajal that we're worthy of this victory. If you're going to have speech of a munafiq, and you're going to be, have the da'wah of a munafiq, of somebody complete defeated, or somebody who's complete, you know, sup, uh, uh, suppressed, and, uh, uh, you know, willingly submissive to the policies of the tawahid, then Allah was never going to help you, in fact. Now, the other point that we can appreciate, and another point of how we can, uh, in fact, 
make this dawah during a time of crisis and uh, you know really cripple the plots of the tawahid is we need to calm the people calm the people and give them uh, sakina this tranquility by understanding the reality the reality of the crisis so we need to teach the ummah what motivates the tawahid this will in fact boost the morale of the muslim ummah so by this how we can do that in our own dawah is teach the ayat of al wala wal bara that will expose the wishes of the kuffar and under, make the ummah understand in fact the conflict between haq and batil and many people they're not aware of this many people they're not uh, aware of the uh, of the struggle between truth and falsehood it's not a matter of targeting somebody's anger uh, or hate towards one particular individual but it's understanding the ideology of disbelief and the ideology of belief how they're in stark comparison with one another and what in fact the one who's upon disbelief which is for the one who's upon belief so we can teach them the following matters number one is that the tahut he wants you to become a kafir allah Jalli said they will never cease to stop fighting you until they turn you back away from your own deen if they can they wish for you to become kafir so that you can become equal all of this being mentioned in numerous ayat, in, in, in particular Baqarah 217. Allah said, and we mentioned this one previously, that they wish to see you dead. Those who disbelieve wish that if you were neglig negligent, have this ghafla of your own arms and your own baggage, wish to attack you in a single rush. So this is what they want, for, want really for the Muslim Ummah inside Balad al-Sham. So for example now, where people they've been having this outcry of poor, of uh, you know, complete shock. Why is it America and UN don't say nothing against Bashar al-Assad? Because Bashar al-Assad, the Sheikh, he is an agent of the West. Is this the same thing? What Obama has been doing is been firing more drones, in fact, than the Bush administration. But Bashar al-Assad is no different from Obama and Bush. There's no difference between them. The policies are exactly the same. It's just their styles and means are a little bit more transparent. It's just a little bit more, you know, of a... Uh, of, of, uh, you know, gory effect, if you will, uh, you know, uh, minus, the, uh, minus the pun, but, uh, you know, this complete transparency on how that torture is being uh, taking place. It's a little bit more explicit way of killing than Obama. Why? Because under Obama and Bush, you find secret CIA torture cells. Secret meaning, as long as you don't see it, shouldn't be too much of a problem for you. But under uh, Bashar al-Assad, what Bashar al-Assad has been doing is being pretty clear. And then more than that, we can teach the people that the Kufar, they wish to see you in pain ya ayyuhal ladina amanu la taktakidu bitanatan min dunikum la la yulanakum khabala waddu ma'nitum qad badat al-baghdad min afwahihim wa ma tuqsiduruhum akbar qad bayna lakum al-ayati in kuntum ta'kilun allah azza wa jalla he said they wish to harm you severely in chapter al imran verse 118 they wish to harm you severely rank hatred has appeared from their own mouths but what their hearts conceal for you is far worse. And this is the beautiful thing today. Nowadays, we have social media. We have access to the internet on the World Wide Web. You can actually go and see inside the hearts of the ones who hate Islam and the Muslims. What exactly they want from you? Somebody, he does some type of an action which is illegal according to the West and, you know, breaks one of their laws and, and offends them. And you find rather than someone to say that this person should be punished, they start to target everybody. They start to say, may all of their children die, all of their women be raped. What kind of injustice, uh, injustice is that? How is that justice? How is that fair retribution? You know, even according to the biblical scriptures, they say an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. It doesn't say that you start to exceed the bounds. And Islam, in fact, it teaches us never to exceed the bounds. That's why even in the rules of jihad, for example, not allowed for, for the Muslim to target the, the women or the children or even the cutting down of trees or even to target uh, the places of worship. For example, the churches, in fact, is not allowed to do so. The Christians under the Islamic state are allowed to live, uh, you know, allowed to do their own worship in private inside their own churches. In an Islamic state, I, I should say, yeah, but uh, not like what you find uh, uh, is being propagated by the West. That in fact, Islam came to just subjugate people and make them into, you know, uh, completely oppressed. In fact, Islam came to liberate the people. More than that, Allah Azza wa said and described to us how the Tawahid, how they want to try and kill Islam. Allah Azza wa said, "Yuriduna an yutfihu nurullahi bi afwahim wa yaba Allah illa illa an yatim illa an yutima nurahu wa laukari al kafirun." They wish to wipe out the nur of Islam with their own mouths, but Allah Azza wa Jalla He will never allow that to happen in Surah at tawbah So what we can teach is that the main dispute between us and the Tawahid is the Deen of Allah Azza wa Jalla. It's not that that's something personal, but if we teach this to the Muslim Ummah, in fact, that that is the conflict, the Deen of Allah Azza wa Jalla. 
between the deen of mankind and man-made false false religions in fact then that will put things into context because uh, the question is being raised by many people today why us why are we being targeted what is it the muslim ummah has done maybe we haven't done enough to pr prove ourselves as being british no in fact it is the age-old conflict between Huck and Batil. And this didn't begin, you know, 20 years ago, 100 years ago. This is the conflict between Adam and Shaitan. This is the conflict between Nuh al -Islam and his own people, between Lut al -Islam and his own qawm, between Musa and Fir'aun, and between Ibrahim and Nimrud and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam against Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl, and, and so on and so forth. This will always be the case, that there will always be a struggle between the Huck and the Batil. Third point is that we must build the trust by offering the Islamic stance. Wa'adullah. This uh, r reminding of the Ummah of Allah Azawajal about the promises of Allah Azawajal. In the Battle of Ahzab, which is known as Battle of Handak, uh, the Battle of the Confederates, there's a surah in fact inside the Quran about this. There was 10,000 Confederates, 10,000 Confederates including Banu Nadir, uh, Banu Qurayda, teaming up with the Quraysh. They formed this alliance against the Muslims. How many were there at that time of the Muslims? Only 3,000. But who was victorious? was the Muslims. So this is a reminder today that when the coalition and the alliance it comes together to try and fight Islam and the Muslims like we find inside Muslim lands, they'll never ever be victorious. They will always be defeated. Why? Because Allah is on the side of the believers and more than that, so long as the Muslim he holds on to his ideology and his belief, then the promise of Allah's, Allah's it will come true. In the time of the crisis, the companions, they uh, re replied, and this is in chapter 33, verse 22. And when the believers, when they saw Al-Ahsab, the confederates, they said, this is what Allah and his messenger has promised us. And Allah and his messenger have spoken the truth. And it only added to their own Iman and submissiveness. Meaning they were looking forward to the hardship and the struggle and the difficulty for the sake of Allah's wajal. Because it became an opportunity for them to try and prove to Allah's wajal, this is what we're about. This is our own Iman. This is our own belief. This is what Allah, he promised that if you're upon this deen, then this is what you're going to face as a trial, as a calamity. As we know, Waraka bin Nawfal, when uh, you know he was the cousin of Khadija, uh, ta'ala anha, and Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when Khadija took him to Waraka, he said, "I wish I, li uh, I wish that I can live long enough to see uh, to see you, you know, in your own dawah, and wish to, so, wish to see you, so I can support you in your own dawah." Why? Because no man came with what you came with, except that he was persecuted, harmed, and in fact, he was turned out by his own people. So today, that should be the reality today. If the man is going to propagate the haq, then he must understand the people of Batil will in fact confront him. And more than that, Allah Azawajal said in chapter at verse 40, If you help him, uh, Muhammad wasallam, not that it matters, for Allah did indeed help him when the disbelievers drove him out. The second of the two, meaning when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr as Siddiq were inside the cave, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to his companion Abu Bakr, do not be sad or afraid, surely Allah is with us. Allah azza he sent down his sakina, calmness, his tranquility and peace up, uh, upon them both and strengthened them via the mal mal malaika which you did not see and made the word of those who disbelieved the lowermost and the word of Allah azza wa the uppermost, meaning the highest. So. This is a great example that during the time of Rasulullah, he faced what we face today as well. Obviously, he faced it much worse. But how these words of tranquility he gave to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. If the Rasulullah would give those words, we should also give the good words to the Muslim Ummah. All of this, my dear brothers, is just a demonstration and an exercise uh, by way of lesson of how we can conduct ourselves in the da'wah with the Muslim Ummah because there is a lack of ulama uh, to do this, in fact, in our own reality today. Fourth point is that we should make lots of du'a kanut. Gather the Muslims, uh, motivate them, culture them, return them back to the examples of tawakkal and make this continuous with the du'a. There's a prerequisite condition for the du'a, in fact, that you believe that he will respond. Yeah, you believe he will respond. Number five is you give the correct solution. Give the correct solution for the problem. So to resist the oppression, you speak up. Uh, against it, you stand firm. You don't start to say that we need to play with our own uh, sewing machines. Rather, you need to strike the Muslims uh, with the, you know, the seeds of taqwa. Teach them about this taqwa. Give them the correct solution for every problem. Uh, number six is that as far as any media work is concerned or any of our own public da'wah is concerned, be as arrogant as possible. That will break 
the back of the helpers of the Tawahith and make their own morale depleted as far as any motivation is concerned. So you want to say to them, Muslim Ummah is very good, very healthy. Muslim Ummah will not compromise their own deen. Muslim Ummah is not affected by these new measures or these new laws. In fact, we'll carry on speaking the truth. This will make the Tawahith and the Tawahud think to himself, <laughs> bite his own fingertips. What is it that I can do against this man? This man, he carries on speaking the truth even though we make all of these laws and measures. So you show them no fear. You teach the Muslim Ummah never to have any fear. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, no one of you will enter paradise. Yes, with an atom's weight of paradise. However, during the time of conflict, you should be as arrogant as possible. Don't start to sit there and cry and whack yourself up like some particular Shia. Remember the ayah, don't become weak, don't become sad. Indeed, you will be the highest if you are believers. Next point is that the call for the struggle for Islam or the call for the struggle in this particular uh, time of fitna should be general and not specific. Uh, meaning, uh, give general guidelines in what the Muslim Ummah needs to learn. Not specific ones. Why? Because not everybody is able to do that. So you're not going to say to somebody, uh, you, my friend, you need to become a spokesperson on BBC and the man, he can't talk. You know, the man, maybe he's, he's got some difficulty. Maybe he's, uh, he doesn't speak the language of the people or whatever. Um, so by general guidance is that you tell the women, for example, and the men, that uh, we should learn Tawheed and we should teach al wala wal bara to our own children uh, and also teach them that victory is not in fact just to liberate the land, but victory is when you stand firm. If the Muslims say stand firm and they, and they don't compromise, then they'll be victorious. If all we teach the people is that we need to fight for mud, and we don't fight for mud, we don't fight for any land or country, but if you, if you fight for mud or fight for land and if you, uh, uh, you know, uh, kick out the occupier, then you'll be victorious. If they're not able to do that, then they'll feel, feel themselves completely defeated. So no compromise, it means that you're victorious. So teach this. Also, uh, with that, is that for certain people, yes, you can give certain people uh, tasks of action. Uh, so for example, encourage the people to do da'wah, command good, forbid evil. Those people have capability for them to send food supplies to the weak, money to the needy. Uh, you know, visit the Muslim prisoners, write to them, support the families, all of these things. There's so many that we could possibly mention. Last point is that we must focus on the status of the believers. And there's a lot more points, in fact, but we know uh, these should be sufficient for us. Number one, in regards to this, is that we must remember that we are the children of Adam, السلام, who have been elevated over any ta'ahud. Yeah, we're above that. You know, نَحْنُ قَوْمًا عَيْزَ اللَّهِ بِالْإِسْلَامِ Umar ibn Qutab, he said, we are people on Ummah who have been dignified by Islam and the Kufr will humiliate anybody. We should always remember this. We should always remember that we are the victorious Ummah, that we are the Ummah of Tawheed, we are the Ummah of, 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 of sanctity, of, uh, of, of dignity and of prestige. Why? Because of our own monotheism, our own belief in this monotheism of Allah's wishes. We don't ascribe partners to Him. We don't lie upon Him. We don't ascribe anything to Him which is not to Him. And we believe in His word and we are people who are submitters to Him. And uh, secondly, is that the, this victory then is the promise from Allah's wajal and uh, uh, Malaika, they will help us. Allah's wajal, He said inside the Quran, تُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَتُجَاهِدُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِأَمْوَالِكُمْ وَأَنفُسِكُمْ ذَلِكُمْ حَيْنًا لَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Allah Azza wa Jalla said in chapter Asaf verse 11, those who believe in Allah and His Rasul and they strive hard in the cause of Allah with their own wealth and their lives and their own property, that is better for you if you but knew. So whatever we have, we should donate for the sake of Allah. Whatever time we can donate or we give and commit ourselves to the da'wah for the sake of Allah, then we should be doing so. It is an, uh, an absence uh, of people today to come out and declare the truth or at least propagate the right ideas of make propaganda for the deen of Islam. They can call it radicalization, but this is, rad you know, call it radicalization then. Propagating the right ideas. The right ideas meaning Islam is the truth, everything else is batil, and Islam came to spread the peace on the earth. When people talk about friends of the earth, the Muslims are the real friends of the earth. Not this kind of rubbish that we find from them. They claim that they're the peacemakers, but in fact, they're the mischief makers. Allah said that inside the Quran. So we need to be able to do that. We need to be able to also purify uh, Islam from any negative propaganda which is being made against it and any lies which are being attributed against it and many lies being made against it in fact as well how Islam came to subjugate the woman and oppress the woman how there's no freedom uh, you know for the Muslim ever to even smile and we're just miserable people no 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 and in fact uh, all of these different things which are being attributed that we worship in fact the black house I mean what kind of lies are these we worship the moon god this is all rubbish which needs defense Ibn Taymiyyah he said Rahmallah. 
um, whoever rises for the deen of Allah and acts upon it and sincerely calls upon it, he is from the true inheritors of the Anbiya and the Prophets, uh, the Prophets and the Messengers. And those people, they are the best people. He described them as a ta'if, a tayyiba, the best people. And they will spread the, 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 this goodness, this deen on the earth, the way the pure water, it spreads and it produces crops. So there is nothing other than good from good. So there can be never, ever, never be anything for us to ever feel down about or depressed about, knowing in fact that if we do the good work, if we do that which is right, then what will come out of that will only be goodness will only be something which will uh, nurture us for something which will be a prosperous life in this life and something which is a good hereafter. And ultimately that's what we're striving for. That's what we're trying to seek. What we're seeking for is for the widening of our own grave. What we're trying to seek is a good uh, palace inside the Jannah, forgiveness for our own sins and whatever actions and whatever sayings and whatever good deeds we can possibly do in order to alleviate ourselves from uh, you know any punishment in the hereafter and for Allah Azza for him to forgive us of our own sins then we should be striving and struggling towards that so the da'wah in the time of crisis is in fact it becomes an opportunity in fact a good opportunity for you to purify your own self if you mean somebody who's a bad Muslim or your own life and there's nothing called a bad Muslim but somebody who's been bad all your life and negligent of your own role and responsibility as a Muslim then it's time for you to step up and become somebody wahid somebody who's going to be you know a team player somebody who's going to be like a true representative an ambassador for Islam, somebody who's going to make tajdeed and revival for Islam, and the Ummah of Rasulullah وسلم, is desperately in need of that. Does not matter how many sins that you committed in the past, you could be fasik, fajr, you could be somebody who's sinful all your own life, you could be somebody who never even prayed your own life, you know, somebody who never even fasted in your own life, but now is the time. Take the opportunity today. Don't wait till tomorrow. Those chances, they don't come every day. The, uh, Allah Azawajal, He's preparing us for victory by giving us these, these opportunities. Allah Azawajal, He's using the policies of the West for this Islamic awakening. This Islamic awakening which is taking place now is a beautiful time. It's a time where the Shabab, the youth, they can wake up to, to their own responsibility. The elders, they can wake up from their own negligence if they possibly had it. The women, they can understand their role and responsibility as mothers, as wives, as, as sisters, as daughters. And the sons, they can understand their own, uh, the sons, they can understand their own responsibility. Every single Muslim, he has a responsibility. And I'll finish with the hadith of Rasulullah where he said, Each and every one of you is on the frontiers of Islam. He's, you're on the frontiers of Islam. So don't let Islam be attacked from your own side. Whatever quite capability you have to try and defend Islam and the Muslims and the deen of Haq against the deen of Batil, then do so. It is something noteworthy, it is something praiseworthy, and it is something which is a characteristic of the people who are the citizens of Jannah. And may Allah will make me and you from amongst those people who are the citizens of Jannah. Jazakallah Hayrun. If there's anything good I said, it's all from Allah. Any mistakes, they are all but my own. وصلى الله سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم جزاك الله خيرا there was a man by the name of Abu Hassan this is true it happened in Egypt a long time ago there was this dictator by the name of Ibn Tulum he imprisoned and killed and tortured so many muslims came to him a man by the name of Abu Hassan he says fear Allah all these people that you have mis you know, un unjustly treated in jails, be fear Allah. He says, you're training me to fear Allah? He took him into this arena. He says, I'm going to punish you, punish me. I've never punished anybody before you. He brought him into this arena. And then he got a, a lion coming out to go and devour him in front of everyone. In front of everybody. The guy sitting, Abu Hassan, his name is, and then all of a sudden, uh, uh, a lion came out, rushing, went into Abu Hassan. You know what Abu Hassan did? Allahu Akbar. He went into the salah. He went into the prayer. At least if I die, I die as a body. Allahu Akbar. The lion came, so going around, Abu Hassan, saliva coming down from the lion's mouth. And then going down, going, Abu Hassan is in his salah. He's not even there. And then all of a sudden, the lion sat down like a kitty, kitty, kitty cat. A kitten sat down. People are watching. They took them out. And Abu Hassan got freed. And they asked Abu Hassan, Yeah, Abu Hassan, we were there when that lion came. What were you thinking? We we're so scared. We thought the lion's going to come and kill you. What were you thinking? You know what Abu Hassan said? He says, Wallahi, I was not thinking of what you guys were thinking of. 
I was not concerned about what you guys were concerned about. I wasn't even afraid of what you guys are afraid of. The only thing I was thinking about, listen, the only thing I was listening, thinking about is the saliva coming down from the lion touching my clothes. Is it najas or not najas? Is it pure or not pure? Because if it's not pure, it will invalidate my wudu. Thus, it will invalidate my prayer. If the entire mankind, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, if the entire mankind from ins and jinn, they come together to harm you, and Allah does not want to harm you, you shall not be harmed. If the entire mankind from ins and jinn, they came together to benefit you, but Allah does not want to benefit you, you shall not be benefited. What can only happen is what Allah has willed to happen. Put your trust on Allah.